this time on The Highland Woodworker. I never intended to do woodworking. I went to school to study Shakespeare. Megan Fitzpatrick is one of the most prolific master woodworkers and writers of our time. And her story is so interesting that it reads like a book and you can't put it down. I didn't have any fear because I didn't know that I was supposed to be afraid of dovetails. I just mm -hmm. thought they looked cool. Plus, something smart for your table saw. The hold down is holding it down right above the cut. It's nice, even pressure. Popular Woodworking Magazine has a helpful how-to on hold downs. These stories and more, this time on The Highland Woodworker. Hello, I'm Charles Brock and I'm a Highland Woodworker. I just love coming to Highland Woodworking in Atlanta, Georgia. It's where I get all my fine woodworking tools and a great woodworking education. The words she writes are as descriptive and detailed as the wood she works. For years, Megan Fitzpatrick has inspired many readers to get into their shop by making the complex much easier to comprehend. See how Megan has gone from Shakespeare to Shaker furniture in our moment with a master. Megan, tell me about your early influences. What was Megan like as a young elementary uh, student. Really obstreperous, I'm assuming. I don't remember. But um, I grew up in old houses and stuff, yeah. and so we were always fixing them up or doing something with our hands. And I guess I got some of my uh, lack of fear to tackle a project from growing up in that sort of environment. And my grandfather trained as a cabinet maker at oh. Louisville's Manual High School. He never actually did it for a living, although he did work for the l and Railroad as a carpenter right after he got out of school. But he had this wonderful tool chest and I just loved it. And there's pictures on my blog. Um, it looks a lot like the Anarchist tool chest, uh -huh. but it has all these sliding trays that I always thought were really cool when I was a kid, but I wasn't allowed to touch it because girls belonged in the kitchen and boys belonged in the workshop. Um, mm -hmm. And I think maybe part of my inspiration was I wanted to show him that wasn't quite true, although I do like to cook too. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Yeah, I understand <laughs> then uh, that, that you wanted to show them that girls and tools were okay. That, I think so. Yeah. And actually, when I was promoted to editor of Popular Woodworking, I can't remember what year that was, 2011 or 12, mm -hmm. uh, there were people who questioned having a woman in charge of a woodworking magazine. I'm not positive, but I think I was the first uh, woman editor of a of a mass market woodworking magazine. Uh -huh. So I, you know, I like to think that I inspired some other people at least a little bit on that front. But, but the interesting thing perhaps is that I never intended to do woodworking. Right? I went to school to study Shakespeare. Shakespeare. I know. Yeah. So <laughs> has a lot to do with it, right? How do you get from Shakespeare to to woodworking and, and make a good fit because it mm -hmm. seems like, well, uh, you're scholarly, is that right? Uh, I used to like to think that I was. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not. Well, but. you've used some words in our conversation today that, that uh, I'd never heard before. So mm, Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. I like words. Well, the, well uh, evidently, and you have a, a great mm -hmm. vocabulary because you're able to oh, take you. some <laughs> of the, the old and teach us woodworkers what it means <laughs> and how, how maybe to use it. So, um, well, let, let's go back to uh, your education and how it ended up sending you on a path that took you to finally to Popular Woodworking Magazine and mm -hmm. to today. Well, I started at the parent company for Popular Woodworking is F&W Media. Well, actually, at the time, it was F&W Publications. It was still a family-owned business. And I started in the marketing department. I had turned in my resignation to go back to school to get a PhD in Shakespeare, well, in early modern drama. Early mm -hmm. modern is what we call that time period. And I was offered the job at Popwood as managing editor, and I said, no, because I'm going back to school to study Shakespeare. And Chris and uh, Christopher Shores and Steve Shaughnessy allowed me to take classes as needed during the day uh, while I was working for Pop Wood, and I would just go back and forth to school and make up the time. As long as everything got done, it was fine. And so I was able to finish all my coursework and take the job at 
pop wood. But you weren't a woodworker. At no, this no, time at all. no, I wasn't. Yeah. Um, but I loved words and learning new jargon. You know, there's always new jargon to learn sure. when you have a new job. Yeah. Like I can reliably spell rabbit now instead of uh, <laughs> like like the little bunny. Right. Um, and after about six months, maybe six months or maybe a year, I decided, well, I'm here. There's these at the time. Let's see. There were five guys on staff who were building out in the shop every day, and I decided, eh, hey, I might as well learn this while I'm here. And I knew my grand my grandfather was still alive at the time. He had a lot of tools. I thought maybe he'd finally let me use them mm -hmm. if I actually knew something. Tell us about kind of your development. You did some <laughs> projects, and they were small things, I guess, mm -hmm. and then they got larger. And we're sitting in the <laughs> middle of of the great... Uh, the 2,800 square foot project. Yeah, yes. there we go. Mm -hmm. All right, so, so tell us about some of that. Well, when I started out, I just, I really wanted to learn to cut dovetails. I'd, one of the first things I did was mm -hmm. learn to cut dovetails, which is something a lot of people are scared of for a long time. I think something that served me well is that nobody ever expected me to be a woodworker. I had told you my grandfather thought yeah, I yeah. shouldn't be. Yeah. Um, it wasn't in 2005 when I joined the magazine. Sure, there were women doing it. And there are lots of women, I should say, who are much better woodworkers than I am, but they just haven't had a lot of exposure. So anyway, I didn't have any fear because I didn't know that I was supposed to be afraid of dovetails. I just mm -hmm. thought they looked cool. Mm -hmm. Anytime I looked at antique furniture, and I've been doing that all my life, uh, dovetails are what you looked at. So I thought, I'll learn to cut dovetails. So I did. Mm -hmm. And I think I approached it without any fear whatsoever. So this is the box that I made with Kelly Mailer down at his school. And you can see that the dovetails aren't great. They're pretty gappy. And uh, my grandfather said I shouldn't be allowed to use such nice wood on my first dovetail project. <laughs> you know, these are just yeah. scraps of walnut. And now I, now I think back and I'm saying that. I'm like, do you know how many scraps of walnut I end up throwing away? And now I feel guilty about it. I hear his voice every time. Anyway. Uh, I like to keep this around, like near me, by my computer. I also have all my old collection of glasses in there. <clears throat> um, <laughs> I keep it with me because it reminds me that even the not best work is going to stay together for years because right. I made this, what, 12, 15 years ago? Mm -hmm. Maybe for, I don't even know anymore. And one of the things I stress to students is that a dovetail is a mechanical joint. Even if it's not perfect, it's almost certainly going to hold your piece together. And if it doesn't, you can add a nail through it, and that'll be fine, too. But the, the dovetail as an exposed joint and as a decorative item, as opposed to simply a utilitarian item, mm -hmm. is a fairly 20th century construct, I think. Yeah. You know, you've got the arts and crafts through tenon, and that was a decorative tenon, a decorative uh, joinery thing. Then you have, say, James Crenoff, et cetera, in, in the, the mid-20th century using the joint, the joinery, as the decoration. And that sort of ruined it for everybody who thinks it has to be perfect <laughs> in order to be good. Yeah. It doesn't. And I stress that in every class that I teach. What is important is that you make a strong mechanical joint that will stay together. The tighter it is to a point, the stronger it is. But it's probably strong enough even if you have a few gaps. And, you know, this is only, what, 10, 15, 20 years old. So it's not really proof of concept. But I've got pieces in this house that are 200 years old they're still together. Dovetails are terrible. doesn't matter. If I have a problem in woodworking and I want to solve it, I think of a hand tool first, not a power tool. Mm -hmm. Apparently that's odd. I don't know why. makes perfect sense to me. Anyway, so I wasn't afraid to learn the hand tools, uh -huh. so that's what I did first. And then I thought, well, I don't really want to surface and uh, size all this lumber by hand. I have to break down and learn the jointer and the planer and the mm -hmm. table saw mm -hmm. and the band saw. So the hybrid shop. Yeah, oh, it's absolutely yeah. hybrid. I don't mm -hmm. find any great joy in taking eight quarter material down to one inch. I, I oh, want to run. No, yeah. it's terrible. Yeah. I'll do it if you if if I'm I can teach a class in it, sure. Mm -hmm. But I don't choose to do it exactly. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to learn how to use the equipment and. Uh, learn that side of things and then also uh, combine that with the hand tool side of things so I could enjoy all of woodworking and not just concentrate on all oh, that's all of woodworking. I can't carve to save my life. Anyway, then I got my, uh, my head on my shoulders or my ass on my shoulders as they say in Georgia, I think, and decided, uh, well, I'm a girl and you think I can only build little stuff, so I'm going to build the biggest stuff in the shop. And I did. So this was 
you know, inspired obviously by a traditional shaker step back, but I made it to hold uh, what were at the time contemporary audiovisual stuff. Now it's you know ten years out of date. So yeah. Um, well, but it's, I, it's I like gorgeous. to take old. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's gorgeous. Well, I like it's... to take an old form and make it work for today, if you will, because people are probably more likely to appreciate uh, uh, what looks to be a period piece of furniture if it still works for their lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So that's what I've, I've tried to do with a lot of the things that I've designed. The whole house is a tremendous woodworking project. It is. And uh, changing this from a, what, a kind of a duplex into a It had a been turned room? into a duplex in the 1950s, and so I'm turning it back into what it was originally when it was built. So. It's really going to shine. Thank I can you. tell. Yes. I know it doesn't look like it, but there's actually been a lot of work done already. <laughs> <laughs> well, Megan, uh, what was the first project? That, uh, that you made or built? Right, well, the first thing you'd probably consider a real project is my dining room table here. I just wanted a simple kind of a X-frame base on it that uh, knocks down, so this whole thing knocks down, although the top is really heavy, so calling it knockdown furniture is a little bit funny. Okay, so that's the first actual joined together project I built, but I have the first uh, project from when I first picked up a sharp knife. You're kidding. No, it's a stick. So I went from one stick to many sticks. There you so go. So that I made at summer camp when I was probably 10, maybe 11, and I just found this stick on the ground and it had a vine wrapped around it. So I thought I was being very clever taking off the bark in between and uh, now I have this spiral thing with it's, it's a live edge project it, made in, exactly. what would that have been? 1978, so well before its time. I, I like to think I was you know, a forerunner of the live edge uh, movement that we're enjoying right well, it's now. It's great that you still have uh, it. It's a, lot of, it's a silly project, but I love that I have it. Because you so. never know where your life is going, and since you've kind right. of made I've got the a walking circle, stick to lead me there. There you go. That's right, or to bop, bop people on the head with. So. All right, <laughs> uh, I see a nice, uh, post and rung chair over there. Is, did you build that? I did. That is uh, a variation on Jenny Alexander's design. It was uh, made, that, that style exactly was developed by Larry Barrett, and that's who taught me and Christopher Schwarz and Brendan Gaffney and a couple of other friends to build that over a week in his shop in Baltimore. And yeah. this was all sort of in preparation for the new version of Make a Joint, uh, not Joint Stool, Make a Chair from a Tree that Lost Art Press is working on. Megan has now set up shop at Lost Art Press, literally. She even has her own bench there. When Megan is not building fine furniture or teaching classes, she uses her editorial expertise to assist in writing, editing, and laying out many of the books Lost Art Press puts on the shelves. And if that's not enough, Megan has even started her very own publishing company. I've been in publishing, in woodworking publishing, for what was it, almost 15 years now. I want to take a book that I think should be out there and make sure it's available to everybody. So I scanned um, an old copy, 1845, of Mechanic's Companion, which is The Nicholson Bench by Peter Nicholson. And this has actually more than just woodworking, it's everything you need to know to build a structure and what goes around it in, uh, this one was 1845. And that appeals to me because of course there's a lot in here about house carpentry and bricklaying and all the stuff you might need, and, and plastering, everything you might need to know to rehab a, a you know, 19th century home. So I decided to start with this one and it's just a reprint, but I cleaned it, you know, these, these pages were all foxed they were all brown, and so I had to clean them all up, and I blew up the type and uh, reproduced the plates nicely, just to try to make this available to a, a, a much larger number of people who couldn't necessarily find a $200, $300 vintage copy. So I'll be doing a couple of these. Um, I have another one coming up that I can't talk about yet. Okay. Um, I'm also working on a book that I'm writing called Shakespeare's Furniture, which is combining um, both of my loves there, looking back at the, uh, the furniture pieces that show up, not just in Shakespeare, but that's the catchy title, uh, in the plays at the time, and then doing a philosophical front section, and then in the back I'll build some of the pieces, so I'll be having 
hopefully, uh, I'm going to say 2021, that'll be out. Oh, wow. So I'm doing that. Uh, that's Rude Mechanicals Press. Um, mm -hmm. Rude Mechanicals, also from Shakespeare, from Midsummer Night's Dream. Snug the Joiner is a Rude Mechanical in Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream. My online handle is one snug the joiner. My business is Rude Mechanicals Press, and so it all sort of ties back into the Shakespeare. Ah, Everything yes. I do, you're kind of coming coming full circle. I am you know, trying yeah. to include everything. I am. That's that's great. It's fun, but I'm also editor of the Chronicle, which is the journal of the Early American Industries Association, and that is a membership organization for people who study, collect, uh, care about the tools and trades that help to build America. So I'm now working on my third issue, and I'm the editor of that. It comes out four times a year. And that is a journal that goes to members of the organization. What, what do you want your legacy to be? Uh, oh, yeah. I want my legacy to be, and I, I don't even want to talk about it in terms of a legacy because I hope it happens within my lifetime. Mm -hmm. And we're back to the words and the adjectives and nouns. Yeah. I don't want there to be the adjective woman in front of woodworker. I want. Ah. I want people to accept, and this is true for all walks of life, and I also want unicorns and rainbow colored cupcakes, I know, but <laughs> to have people just say, oh yeah, she's a woodworker, or he's a woodworker, or not, oh, she's a woman woodworker. I just don't like the adjectival construction when it comes to describing people, mm -hmm. and I hope that I can have some small part in helping to overcome that and just see people for who they are and not defining them by gender, but by what they're able to do and how they choose to present themselves and their work. I, th I think <laughs> you're on that path. I hope so. I'm going to continue forging down it. Later in the show, Megan teaches us her dovetail layout technique. But first, make a smooth move on your table saw. Popular Woodworking Magazine shows us how. You're watching The Highland Woodworker. I'm just an average down-to-earth woodworker. On a scale of one to 10, I'm probably about a five. But one place I score a perfect 10 is right here. And I plan on keeping all 10. That's why I have a saw stop table saw. And there's more. Plenty of power, superior dust collection, and absolute accuracy. These features have made it the best selling cabinet saw in America. Order a Saw Stop professional cabinet saw in March or April of 2019 and choose either one of these accessories for free. That's a $249 extra value. Put a Saw Stop in your shop. A lot of folks say they just don't make tools like they used to anymore. I don't know, I suppose that's true in some cases. But the good stuff is still out there. I'm talking about the tools that are just a pleasure to use, that are well designed to get the job done quickly and efficiently, and are made to last so they get passed on to the next generation. Whatever tools my grandkids use, I know one thing, they'll be keeping them Tormac sharp. <laughs> Woodworkers count on American-made forest saw blades for smooth, quiet cuts every time, without splintering, scratching, or tear-outs. The famous Woodworker 2 is the all-purpose combination blade. But for special cuts, Woodworker 2s are available for cutting dovetails, for flat bottom joinery. A 30-tooth blade is perfect for ripping, a 48-tooth blade for superior cross cuts, and a finger joint blade set. There is a perfect forest Woodworker 2 for every table saw cut. Highland Woodworking has been a leader in woodworking education for more than 30 years. 
They offer all kinds of woodworking classes year round, ranging from how to hand cut dovetails and mortises to how to sharpen a plane or a chisel, how to build a cabinet, a chair, or a bookcase, or how to turn a wooden bowl. There are classes on wood finishing, French polishing, and even antique furniture restoration. For a list of upcoming classes that may interest you, just look in their catalog or go to highlandwoodworking.com. Hey there Highland Woodworker fans, here at Popular Woodworking we are happy to share our tips and tricks with you for every episode. Take a look at this one, hope you enjoy it. Hi, I'm Zane Powell, I'm at Mark Adams School and we have an interesting hold down that uh, several years ago Roger Cliff uh, did a quick knockdown. We were running the shaper table actually and uh, he showed us how to make a, a feather board different than what when I think of a feather board you think of one of those diagonal things with the cuts in it and he designed this and uh, made it up for us and then from there we've altered it many times for many different purposes. There's a few examples here and then I'd like to just draw one out and show you how simple uh, and versatile that you can make them. Okay so I'm going to draw a, a little uh, feather board here. I, I happen to have a piece of half inch Baltic birch which is excellent as most of us that have used it know. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, start off with where probably the clamp will, will be. I'm going to bring this up. The other clamp will be on this side. I'll bring that up. And then we want the part that actually holds down to be lower. So I'm going to go here. And then what it does from here to there is really not, not important. The important part of this is I'm going to cut from here. I'm going to come to this side to a hole I'm going to drill. And then my next one will start here. I'm going to cut across to another hole that I'm going to drill somewhere in here. And then likewise, I might be able to get in one more line. Maybe I'll bring this up higher. I'll cut across here. And it looks nice if you kind of line them up. It's not important. But what this is going to do for me is this will allow me to use this. Uh, I could use it on a router table. It's the clamp could come up here. It doesn't matter. But with it being such a low profile, if I call it that, on a table saw fence, I can put this and clamp it to a table saw fence and my material can still uh, come below because most fences on a table saw are about two and a quarter inches high. Okay, so I'm just going to drill three holes here close to where I marked that. It's somewhat irrelevant. Nice clean holes are nice. Okay, and then we'll go to the bandsaw. Okay, so at the bandsaw, first I'm gonna cut out the, the shape here, and then I'll come back and cut the actual working part of the jig. And the way I'll do that is I'll cut a bandsaw cut and a half. So as a, a table saw blade, we think of it as an eighth inch cut, and a bandsaw we think of as a sixteenth. Uh, we need a little more room in there for springiness, so you'll see me cutting that a, a couple of times. Okay, so that's where my wood's going to pass underneath, and this is the springy part. Okay, so there you have your springy feather board and a place to put the clamps so you can raise it up higher or drop it down lower. Cool, eh? Put a little round over on that and jazz it up. People would buy those, I guess. Or you could give them as gifts. They make great stocking stuffers. With a couple clamps, uh, I've clamped that on. Set my board here. We would turn this on, make our cut. The hold down is holding it down right above the cut. It's nice, even pressure. And then when I get to here, from a safety standpoint, if I were running 
cabinet frame stock. Uh, I wouldn't let go of it like that, but uh, I would be ready with a, a push stick that grips it from the, the back side, but from, from the side and not from the top. But certainly, if you've got a feather board, how many times have we used a feather board, but now you can't put your push stick on, so everything's in the way. Well, you just gotta lay it down and use it in the different plane. So, it's quite nice, actually. Hope you enjoyed that trick. Look for another one on the next episode of The Highland Woodworker. Coming up, Megan Fitzpatrick shows us her simple way of setting up dovetails. You'll want to see this. You're watching The Highland Woodworker. For 35 years, Lee has manufactured the world's best joinery jigs. From our award-winning dovetail jigs and mortise and tenon jigs, to newer innovations like router table jigs. Easily add strong, beautiful joinery to your woodworking pieces like half-blind dovetails, box joints, mortise and tenon joints, and through dovetails. Lee, simply the easiest and most versatile router joinery jigs. Whiteside Machine Company has been in business for over 30 years providing customers with quality router bits. Fine Woodworking Magazine has declared Whiteside Router Bits best overall and best value when compared against 17 other brands. No matter the router application, they have the type and profile of carbide router bit you need. When you put a Whiteside Router Bit to work in your shop, it is guaranteed to make you smile. Highland Woodworking stocks a wide selection of Rikon power tools known for their innovative design and rugged durability. Highland has sold thousands of Rikon's industry-leading band saws with sizes to fit every woodworking need, from the compact affordable 10-inch model to competitively priced 14 and 18-inch models. Shop us also for Rikon's reliable planers, lathes, and professional low-speed grinder, all with an exceptional five-year warranty. Rikon. Power tools. This show is about sculpture that rocks. Watch it at charlesbrockchairmaker.com. Let's go. If you can't make it to Highland Woodworking in Atlanta, Georgia, you can shop online at highlandwoodworking.com. They're great at getting what you want to your shop quick. Moment with a Master is brought to you by Highland Woodworking. Fine tools since 1978. Let Highland's legendary wood slicer resaw blade help make it easy for you to get great results sawing thick lumber into thinner boards. The wood slicer is designed to cut much faster, smoother, and quieter than ordinary bandsaw blades. You'll be amazed at how smooth a surface you'll get with a wood slicer. Its variable tooth pattern greatly reduces noise and vibration. Order a wood slicer from Highland Woodworking for your bandsaw today. We're at Megan's Bench at Lost Art Press in Covington, Kentucky. And she showed us her first dovetails, <laughs> and now you have really become a master of the dovetail. I'm a master, but I've become better. Better, yeah. yes, all right. Well, layout is so important, and I think you have uh, a little lesson for us or sure. some techniques for laying yeah. it out. Well, this is something Christopher showed me years ago, and it just made sense to me because I use two pairs of dividers. I leave those set 
throughout an entire project. So if I have 10 drawers, then it is really easy to replicate the exact same layout on mm -hmm. all of them. And I just like the, the nice regimented look, if you will, the elegant look that that gives to something. Yeah. So um, I already marked one baseline. I have set my gauge just to the thickness of my wood. And so I'll mark the second piece here. I'm gonna gang cut these because this is for a quote utility project. It's for my tool chest, uh, mm -hmm. my new one here. Um, so I'll just mark out my baselines, and this is my tail board on the sides. I want the tails on the sides because I want the mechanical interlocking nature of the joint to work um, for me instead of against me. If I were to put the tails on the fronts, when I pull on it, you mm -hmm. could pull the front off. That's why on kitchen drawers, for example, or all drawers, you'll see the dovetails, uh, the, the tails on the side, so that when you pull forward, you're not pulling the drawer front off. So I'm doing the yeah. exact same thing here. And then, with my baselines marked, I'm going to look at my end grain. I want the heart side of the board facing out. So this one is facing out, this one is not. I'm going to flip it around. Now, the reason I do that is because if it starts to warp um, through seasonal movement, the joint itself will help hold things flat. So if I can, you know, if the appearance looks okay, because that's going to trump everything, <laughs> I'll put the heart side out, which is what I've done here. So, with that done, I'll just make sure they're lined up exactly the same here and slide them into my vise. Tighten that down. Okay, so I've got two pairs of dividers here and I'm going to mark off the half pin here at either end and I just sort of eyeball this. It's not actually half the width of what my pins end up being, but it's a half pin because you only have the angle on one half of the joint. You could set it to be half of one of your pins, but that might be a little weaker than I want it to be mm -hmm. in this case. So, so I'll set that aside and leave it like that until I'm done with all my projects, or my project. That'll be my half pins on any drawer that, or till that I cut. And then I take a second pair, and I think I want three tails across here. Okay. So I'm going to drop my divider leg into that first little hole mm -hmm. and walk down the board. One, two, three. Oh, wait a minute. You're over. I know. And it, very important that you have to count as you move down the board. I can't right. get it right unless I count. I am over, and I want to be <laughs> over three. Exactly. The distance from this pinhole to that leg is what the top of the pin is going to look like when I'm done. Uh -huh. And I might want that just a little bigger. So I'm just gonna open these up a tiny, tiny bit. And uh, as I walk down the board, of course, it grows exponentially with each turn. So you don't wanna adjust them too much. And I'm gonna try again. So again, drop it in that pin hole. One, mm -hmm. two, Three, again, with the counting, mm -hmm. right? So now that's going to be the distance at the top of my pins, and that's pretty good for a yeah. tool chest project. So this time when I walk down, I'll drop them in and stab. One, two, again with the counting. But instead of stabbing the third one in, I pick them up, I drop it in my other half pin hole, and walk back down the other way and stab in. Yeah, now so what that, it. Yeah, so what yeah. that tells me is that's where my dovetail gauge is going to go. Uh, I'll drop my pencil in here, come across. I do the two half pins first. I don't know why, I just do. Um, and the reason I like to do tails first is because I can gang cut them like this. Also, I think that a tail cut is a harder cut than a pin cut. And so if I do the hard one first and then match the easier cut because it's a straight down cut to mm -hmm. my tail cut, I have a much better chance of, of a really nicely dovetailed board instead of one that will just stay together. Yeah. So I've marked both ends, and then I'll come across and just work my way down. And you can see I'm going across both of my pieces here. And I believe I've chosen a six, a one to six degree on this one. And did I get it back? Get it right upside down and backwards. And then I always, always, always tell my students to mark the waist because that helps you get the cut right. And then you mark it on top too. And really that's it. And you can see, oh, I missed my hole there. We'll look at this one. So the distance in between, that is the same distance that I crossed over down here when I was Perfect. laying them out. And yeah. then I'm, I'm pretty much ready to saw at that point. All right. So, there you go. So between the twos,
mm -hmm. and the counting to three. That's right. We've got some great dovetails. I hope so. Lay it yeah. out, now I just gotta cut them well. This is a Porta Cable dovetail jig. It's a 4200 series. And anytime you use a dovetail jig, there are a couple of things that you're going to be concerned about. One, uh, the stability of your router. Two, the router dust and chips are gonna fly everywhere, probably back at you. Well, our friends at Lee have solved the problem with the VRS-1200. Now, the VRS-1200 is an attachment to the jig. You put it on one time and you're done. When you're looking for innovation in routing accessories, Lee has the answers. Lee premium dovetail and joinery jigs have been recognized as the world's finest for over 35 years. The Lee D4R Pro Jig is the most versatile and user-friendly dovetail jig available. The Lee FMT Pro Jig, along with your router, turns your workshop into a full mortise and tenon factory. The Lee RTJ400 Router Table Dovetail Jig is designed to provide fast and accurate routing of dovetails and box joints on your router table. Highland Woodworking is proud to stock these and many other Lee Dovetail and Joinery Jigs. Improve your woodworking experience. Sign up for Wood News Online a monthly newsletter showcasing the latest news, tips, and classes Highland Woodworking has to offer. By signing up, you'll receive the latest episode of the Highland Woodworker, special store promotions, and Wood News Online delivered straight to your inbox. Sign up today. That's all the time we have for the show today. But check us out on social media and come back to see us next time on the Highland Woodworker. Thank you.